Over the years, I've developed an instinct for getting to know a place well in a short period of time. As soon as I know where I'm going, I start reading about it. I read guidebooks, travel books, history books, novels that are set in the place. Unlike the guidebooks, novels give me atmosphere and they give me insight. If I'm traveling in the US, I'll read magazines and newspapers from the place I'm going. I also read maps. I love to have an imprint of the city in my head when I get to it. If I'm traveling abroad, I'll watch movies from the country and I'll listen to music from the country. I'll also study some of the language. A few words are going to help with everyday interactions. The more I know about the language, the more it's going to tell me about the culture. In English, we have the word homesick. In German, they have the word Fernweh. It's the opposite. It's that feeling you have when you're home of wanting to be elsewhere. One th another thing I do, I tell everybody I meet where I'm going. I want to know what people think about the place. And if they don't think much of it, it means it's going to be a good trip. Also, you tell people where you're going, and chances are somebody will say, I know somebody there. So you get the name and address. You head off with a list of contacts. The first thing I do when I get to the place is walk. I do it, try to do it in the first hour or two when everything appears fresh and new. It's different and you're walking around and you're, you're using your instincts. Now, I went to Poland for the first time in 1978. Poland was part of the communist bloc and I walked around Warsaw fascinated by the mannequins. We were really drab, some of them weren't even wearing shirts. And they were unlike any mannequins I'd ever seen. And the women on the street were quite fashionable. And there was an explanation for this. In those days, Poles had more freedom to travel than other Eastern Europeans. So in the summer, students would go abroad. They'd get jobs, make money, buy new clothes, and come back to Warsaw and make the mannequins look pretty ridiculous. Using your instincts when you're traveling, you come to an intersection. You, you try to decide which street looks the most promising. I, you know, ideally, I want to run across something interesting, a festival, a wedding, maybe a demonstration. I want to see life happening. After walking, I get tired, so I sit. Sitting's important, because it takes you out of the crowds and allows you to observe the people better, how they dress, how they walk, how they greet each other. Also, when you're sitting, you can close your eyes, and then your other senses kick in. You s notice the sounds of the place and the smells. If you're sitting in a cafe, you smell foods that you may never have had before, so you order something to eat. Eating's an important part. You know, you, the, it's the easiest and probably the most enjoyable way to absorb a culture. You swallow it. Sometimes when I'm sitting, I'll take out a notebook and sketch a building. When you draw something, you really have to look at it in all its detail. I'll also take out a camera and take pictures if I've been sitting there for a while, and then I become part of the scenery, so people don't notice me as much. So I'm unobtrusive, I can get more captive pictures. The next thing I do is I try to participate in the life of the place. And this is not always easy, because tourists have their own world of hotels and restaurants and museums and tourist attractions. The locals have their apartments and offices and beauty salons and parks. So using my instincts, I go where the locals go. I go to markets. I go to sporting events. I go to book readings, gallery openings. I try to strike up conversations with people. And that's not easy, always easy either because there are language barriers. And not every culture has that idea of talking to strangers that we have in the US. My first assignment as a travel editor ever was to Spain and Portugal. And in Madrid, and Barcelona, and Seville, I walked the streets, I ate in the restaurants, I visited the sites, I knew something was missing. I got to Lisbon, I called the one contact I had, a poet by the name of Casimiro, and he invited me to dinner one evening with his girlfriend. We had a wonderful dinner, and after, he said, let's go hear some Fado music. 
Now, I'd seen restaurants around the city that had folkloric evenings. This wasn't one of them. This was a dive filled with men who looked like longshoremen. And every once in a while, one of them would get up and sing this song of heart-wrenching melancholy. And Kashmiro would sometimes translate with a look of great pride and satisfaction on his face. That night, that night, I learned how to travel as a travel writer. You approximate as best you can the life of a local. Now, people are an essential part of the travel experience. You can't really know a place unless you meet the people who live in it. They give you information. Sometimes it's just the name of a good restaurant. The best ones give you insights. And as in Lisbon, I've found I've had my best success with people in the arts, writers, actors, musicians, sculptors, cartoonists. You know, artists work flexible hours, so they have more time to hang out with strangers. Also, they kind of live outside society, in the margins, so they have an interesting perspective on it. Sometimes you hit it off with the people you meet, and they invite you home for a meal. This is the travel writer's holy grail. And you feel incredibly fortunate. You're getting to see how people live. You're getting beneath the surface of the place. And as you sit there eating their food and hearing their stories and joining in their toasts, you realize that people give you more than just information and insight. They also give you an emotional connection. You know, that place is no longer just the site of your vacation. It's the home of your new friends and sometimes their dogs. It takes on a meaning that you never imagined when you were home preparing for the trip. Thank you.